morning. You know, one of the interesting things, my wife got a new dog not too long ago, and um, it's a little puppy, and you know how little puppies are, and, and we, there's another dog in the house, and you know, it is interesting, what you do for one, you had better do for the other, right? It's like you give one a treat, and the other one's like, is there a double standard here? You know, how many of y'all have kids? All right, you ever hear, that's not fair, you let them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> y'all are like, you, you know what I'm saying. You know, it is amazing whether it's kids, whether it's our pets, whether it's us. Aren't we all very sensitive to somebody getting favoritism over us? All right, we're, we're kind of dialed into that. We, we're pretty sensitive to when, okay, somebody else got this and I didn't, whether it is something that is like just basic appreciation, basic uh, dignity, things of that nature, we're very sensitive to partial judgment, to favoritism. Um, as we get into uh, chapter 2 of James, James is dealing with this. He's dealing with partiality or favoritism, and he hits this um, kind of as a natural overflow. In fact, it's kind of a segue from chapter 1 to chapter 2. In chapter 1, at the end, he's talking about how your faith should act, or because you are a believer, it should ex your actions should express themselves like this. Uh, in the last chapter, he ended talking about true faith cares for orphans and widows, or the helpless, people that cannot help themselves, the the oppressed, the people that doesn't, they don't have someone to stand for them. Uh, true faith stands for the people that can't stand for themselves, all right? And then he ends that chapter, and uh, he says, he says to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, we're not supposed to be conforming to the world. We're not supposed to reflect what the standards of the world are in our lives, we're supposed to reflect our faith. There should be something different about us. We should stand out because of what we profess to believe. Because we have been changed, it should impact the way we relate to God and the way we relate to others. Then he starts chapter 2, my brothers, my fellow Christians, my family, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory. Now, partiality. Partiality is basically favoritism. It's the sin of extending special favor to someone. Now, why do we extend special favor to someone? Sometimes people do that because you see somebody and you think it's a utilitarian view. You say, I think this person, it would benefit me from knowing them. It would benefit me by showing extra kindness to them. We see people, in other words, we value them on what they can do for us, right? You ever seen that? You ever been guilty of that? I think we all have, haven't we? We tend to gravitate towards, if we don't watch it, we can gravitate towards the people that it would help us to have a relationship with them. The other thing, partiality and favoritism is, we tend to gravitate towards those that are like us. We tend to want to show favor to people that like the same things that we like, that dress the same way that we dress, that talk the same way that we talk, look the same way that we look. The family of God, and I'm going to get into this in a few minutes, being a follower of Jesus Christ transcends anything that we have, any other thing that we have in common with people. It is our faith in Christ that bonds us together as believers that make us the family of God, right? And that is based on, showing no partiality is based on the righteousness of God. The other thing, one of the things we have to ask, how do I treat people that can do nothing for me? Watch people how they treat servers in a restaurant. I don't care if your food's not cooked good. 
I don't care if the service wasn't great. Christian, there's no excuse for you ever to be rude to a person. Yep, amen. And it's sad, I don't know how many times. I, the, the, the worst day for servers in a restaurant is what day? Common knowledge. Common knowledge. And it's sad, it breaks my heart. Because it is, it comes back uh, and, and hinders the kingdom of God. Um, so as James is getting into this, he, he says, my brother, show no partiality. Because God himself shows no partiality. In, in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 17, it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods. Notice little g. He's the God, big G, of gods, who are really no gods at all. And Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Who, what do all these people have in common? They're the defenseless. They're those that can't help themselves. They're not the victims of poor choices. They're not facing simply the consequences of bad decisions that they made. These are people that an orphan, a widow a sojourner, people who are seeking out something better for their lives. These are the people that God protects. These are the people that we're supposed to be about. Peter, kind of coming on the same uh, thought here, 1 Peter 1, verse 17, he says, And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. When we do not show partiality, we're more like Jesus, right? Um, so he, he begins this, don't be, don't be stained by the world, don't be conformed to the uh, behavior of the world to those type of ways of thinking, but instead show no partiality. And then he goes on into verse 2 and he gives an example. He gives a hypothetical example. Verse 2 he says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this nice seat. But then you say to the poor man, you stand over there, you sit down right here in the floor. He says, have you not then made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? By the way, let me stop there for a second. There are a lot of pastors who are incredibly guilty of this because they make their people feel like you're just a seat. I, you're here to fill a seat so I can be validated because I'm preaching to a full sanctuary. God help the pastor who makes people feel like they're simply a number. When he says this, God help the church when they make people feel like they're a little less valuable when they walk in the doors. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, my family, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man and not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Now, I want to talk about a couple of things so that we're on the right path here. Is he saying that all rich people, anybody who has money, is awful and can never be saved? No, that's not what he's saying. There are many wealthy people in Scripture that their wealth has been a conduit of God's blessing. In other words, God blessed them. They are simply a conduit to let the blessings of God flow through them and to bless other people. There are several examples of people like that. Uh, rich, in faith, rich in faith and in material wealth. Joseph of Arimathea. You see uh, the, in Scripture, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23. 
uh, he is the one that provided the tomb when Jesus was buried. Okay? He's a very wealthy man that followed Christ and not only followed him in a profession, but followed him with his life. Um, you see Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19, a guy that was greedy, a guy that was a tax collector, just reviled, hated by the Jewish people. He came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and he said, if I've ripped anybody off, if I've taken anything that I don't deserve, I will pay back fourfold. All right? He followed up his profession with a change in his life and being rich in faith towards other people. You see, Lydia, Acts chapter 16, when you read about Lydia, you understand that she was a very wealthy lady who dealt in material goods. Um, she was one of those people that God used to see a lot of lives change. So these people, God blessed materially, but they were conduits of that blessing to others. Now, so you have wealth as a conduit of blessing with some, but then you see wealth as a barrier uh, to, uh, for others. Um, it's when status, value, and power become the ideal. Jesus spoke to this a lot. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. What are you pursuing? Right? Um, back in Matthew 19, uh, verse 16, it's the, the account of the rich young ruler, the guy that came to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus uh, it, it, you can go and read the account later, but Jesus gives him several of the commandments. He says, do this, do this, and do this. Now, was Jesus doing that to say that you can earn salvation? No, he was trying to point out something. He gave him so, several of the commandments to show him that he hadn't kept them perfectly. But the guy was a little bit delusional, and he says, all of these I have kept. Jesus said, okay. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Now, why did Jesus say that to him? He said it to no one else in Scripture for this reason. The rich young ruler, the guy, the young guy that had all that money, was delusional about this. He did not possess wealth. Wealth possessed him. And you see, that is the big thing. It's not money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of it. It's the passion for it. It's when it has you instead of you having it. That is when it becomes a barrier in your relationship to the Lord. Um, in Matthew 19, 24, he says, Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You know, and it says, when you read that account, it says that the apostles were, well, if, if, if he can't be saved, what about us? Why? Because wealth was looked at as a blessing from God. Can wealth be a blessing from God? Absolutely. There are a number of people throughout my years in ministry that God has blessed financially that have touched many lives, and they never want to be known for it. They want to do it secretly. However, there have been some over the years where the passion for money, the love to be rich, has consumed them. And they make an excuse for always putting it first in their life over God and over family. So we see some like uh, Herod the Great uh, was another one that was a very wealthy guy. Matthew chapter 2, you can read about him. And then Acts chapter 19, um, you see... Demetrius, a silversmith. In fact, it says that Demetrius was a silversmith who made silver shrines uh, of Artemis. He brought no little business to the craftsmen. When he heard that Paul was preaching the gospel and people's lives were being changed, people's lives were being transformed. What happened when all these people got saved, when there were hundreds, when there were thousands of people coming to know the Lord, what do you think happened to the idol selling business? It started going like this. Well, the people that were getting rich by selling idols, what do you think their attitude was? 
you guys are bad for business. We've got to stop this. So he gets all the idol makers together, all the silversmiths, and all, and he says, we, we've got a problem. This Paul is preaching this message that says, idols made with hands are no gods at all. It's destroying our wealth. Now, this is the thing that consumes you. He wasn't worried about whether his message were true. He was worried about the fact that it was costing him money. So this is the type of thing that Paul's talking, or that James is talking about when he is talking about the rich. He is not saying that all uh, wealthy people are evil and that, that people possessing things is wrong. He's saying not that when you possess it is wrong. It's saying when you when it possesses you. So. Uh, I wanted to kind of clarify that and go into that when he's talking about it because it can be a little confusing. Now, let's look in the bulletin. We're going we're gonna to go back and we're going to hit some of the main points of this passage. First thing, favoritism or partiality contradicts faith. Favoritism contradicts faith. He says, my brothers. In other words, my family. My family. See, we have in our faith, it's a, it's a sense, it's our identity, right? This is your next bullet. How, uh, how, does faith, how does favoritism contradict faith? Number one, in our identity. We're, part, we're a family. What joins us together is not the commonality in the type of job that we have, the way that we dress, what we look like, what sports team, what, the color of our skin. No, what unites us as believers is our faith in Jesus Christ. That trumps everything. It transcends everything. That's why all of these little... You don't have motorcycle Christians. You don't have uh, uh, cowboy Christians. You don't have this kind of Christian. You don't have that kind of Christian. You don't have this. You have the, how, you have the family of God. Right? That... that trumps, that transcends any other distinction that you can come up with. In this case, you don't have rich Christians and poor Christians. You don't have, oh yeah, that's the First Baptist Church of the poor over here. This is the First Baptist Church of the rich over here. No. You have the kingdom of God. You see, family is what we're about. It's a family that you enter into when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now here's the thing. If you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're not part of that family. You say, well, Chris, that's harsh. It is, and it's true, but I've got good news for you. How do you become a part of that family? By repenting of your sin and trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what it means to be part of the family of God. It gives you a place where you belong. If there is anything that I've seen in the world that we live in today, it's everybody needs a place to belong. Everybody. Our faith in Christ is what brings us together. If there's anything that our world is looking for, it's a place to belong where people are authentic. Where you don't walk in and everybody's pretending to be something that they're not. Authenticity. Now, let me say this. That doesn't mean that I walk in with all of my sin and all my baggage and say, you're just going to have to accept me like I am. No, that's not true either. But Jesus was a friend of sinners. Yes, but they didn't stay that way. Every person, when you come to Jesus, it changes your life. Jesus preached a message of transformation. Listen, they didn't crucify Jesus because he healed people and fed people. They crucified Jesus because of why? The message that he preached. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That's why Jesus was crucified. It wasn't because he said, oh, look, you just stay the way you are and come follow me. You will never find that message in Scripture. But he was a friend to sinners. Why? Because he showed no partiality. None. No favoritism. When Jesus Christ came and died on that cross, he died for every man, woman, and child. 
that has ever lived and ever will live. So our identity, favoritism contradicts faith in our identity. It also contradicts who Christ is. He says in verse 3, um, in verse 1, he goes on, he says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. When we show favoritism, it contradicts who Christ is. Um, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only son. To die for who? People that live in the United States of America. No. He, for every person that lives anywhere at any time. That's who Jesus Christ died for. So it shows a contradiction when we show favoritism in who Christ is, the Lord of glory. We can't, when he was talking about rich people showing favoritism between the rich and the poor, it was that they were valuing wealth more than they were valuing Jesus. In the church over the years, I've seen that happen not just with money, but in the way people look. As a student pastor early on, we were reaching you know, back in the day, back in the 90s, do y'all remember all the skateboarders? Remember, remember the, the, the jeans that the legs were this long all the way down and you get to the, the bottom and they were still that big? How many wore, honestly now, I admit to you, how many wore those? Okay, one person. All right, y'all are lying. All right, all right. But I remember us reaching to kids and, you know, we would go we would go and pick them up and bring them to church. They would come in, they had their ball caps on, they had the, all the baggy clothes and the, the baggy jeans and had their skateboards with them. And I remember one time a guy that was a little bit older than me, we were walking out uh, and I saw him, he had one of these young men cornered. He said, you're going to have to dress different. We don't let people in our church looking like this. If you're going to come here, you got to... And just was going off on me. My friend who was with me got to him first. And he lit that guy up. He said, you do not talk to this young man like that. And I mean just grilled him. That's not what we're about. That's who, we're supposed to be reaching who? Everybody. Right? Not just the people that look like me, think like me, and act like me. And that's what James is saying here. We're inviting people into the family. People who Jesus Christ died for. We do not show favoritism because what does that say about what we think about bringing them into the family? And then also because of who Jesus is. Jesus died for that person. How dare you show some type of favoritism against that person? Philippians 3.8 says, in, in, indeed, Paul's writing this, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul looked at everything that he had gained, every, every valuable asset that he had, every achievement that he had, he counted them as garbage. In fact, in the Bible it says dung compared to knowing Jesus. All the money I've ever earned, all the accomplishments I've ever had, I count them as dung compared to knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So Paul's saying, I would never do anything. I would never do anything. I would never treat anyone that Jesus died for with disrespect because of the valuable blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross for them. He goes on, Verse 5, he says, listen. In other words, you know, James doesn't listen, heed. You all remember what I said about that? When my dad used to say, are you hearing me? He didn't mean, did I hear him? He, he meant, do you understand what I'm saying? Well, James is saying, he says, listen, my beloved brothers, my family, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? When we show favoritism, it contradicts our faith in what we identify as family, who Christ is, and what we value. Faith is more, our faith in Christ is more valuable than anything that we can possess or anything that we can do. Matthew 19, 23 
It says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who then can be saved? Wealth gives people a false sense of security. But you know, if there's anything that I have learned in my lifetime, wealth does not protect you from death. Wealth does not protect you from criticism. Wealth does not protect you from a lot of things. In fact, you can, if I called out the names of some of the richest people that ever lived, we, would, we wouldn't know who they are. It's amazing what happens over time. He's saying what we value, our faith is more valuable than anything else. In 1 Peter 1, verse 6, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, in James's experience, he had watched rich people exploiting Christians or dominating them because their faith. Christians were looked down on. He had watched the rich dragging them into court. Why would they drag them into court? Because the rich could afford powerful attorneys. The poor couldn't. They couldn't defend themselves. The rich were blaspheming the name of Christ. This is what James was seeing um, in the early church. When we look at the rich man and Lazarus, we see kind of the same thing. Uh, Luke 16, you can read that later, of where you had a rich man who had all of these things at his disposal. You had Lazarus, the guy that was in poor health, and because he couldn't work, because he couldn't provide for himself, was on the street. Lazarus dies, He's in heaven, the rich man dies, he's in hell. Our faith should make a difference in the way that we live our lives. So favoritism contradicts faith. Favoritism also breaks the royal law. Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, favoritism is a sin because it violates Christ's law of love. You know, when we talk about loving our neighbor, who is your neighbor? It, 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 it's the people that you live next to. It's the people that you work with. It's the people that you go to school with. It's the people that you come in contact with anyway. That's your neighbor. When it says to love your neighbor, it means putting yourself second. It means, how can I be a blessing to someone? Now, students, I, I, I really want to talk to you guys about this, and then I, I'll talk to everybody else first. Wherever we go, wherever we spend our time, there are a lot of different groups of people, all right? When I'm up at, at, at any of the high schools, it's interesting. I know y'all think, gosh, he's so old. He doesn't, he, I can't believe he even remembers high school. But it, it's, it's interesting. When I go back to the schools, if you close your eyes, it's the same groups of people, only the faces have changed. All right? There are those, you, you, you've got the people that excel in different things, whether it's academics, whether it's sports, whether it's, it's a band, choir, whatever. And you have, you have some people that don't excel in anything. And high school, listen, high school has been to this point in their life the worst experience they have ever had. They feel alienated. They hate getting up every morning to walk into that school. Are we showing the love of Jesus to them? It, it, it's, is it, let me ask you guys something, be honest with me. As I'm saying this, are there faces that pop into your mind at your school who you would say, yeah, I, I, I know some people like that, that nobody talks to, they're by themselves, they, 
pretty much eat by themselves. They walk down the hall by themselves. Nobody ever really spends time with me. Would y'all say that you, a face comes to mind? Okay. Listen, when you get older, it doesn't change. In the workplace, it's the same way. There are those people that are just odd. You're kind of like, what is that dude's deal? He's weird. Oh, he's just out there. Yet she just, you can't, she can't talk to her. I don't know. I, we tried to talk to her. You just can't talk to her. What are we doing to demonstrate Christ's love to them? Now you say, Chris, you're going at, you know, people in high school, they get over that stuff. I want to tell you, when right when we moved back here, we had our 30-something year reunion. I can't remember which one it was. 30, 30, whatever. It's been a long time. Longer than I like to admit anyway. And I remember there, I had not been in contact with a lot of people I went to school with. And I remember there was this one lady that um, went to school with, and she was that person. Nobody really ever talked to her. She kind of stayed in a corner in whatever class we were in. Didn't interact with a lot of people. In fact, she was aggravated, and life was made fairly miserable for her. I remember I saw her and talked to her, and I was like, hey, you know, the reunion's coming up. She said, yeah, I'm not going. I said, listen, come, come and sit at the table with us. I, I'm not going. I said, you should come. She said, Chris, I don't think you understand. That was the worst experience of my life. Now, here's somebody in their 40s that still can't get over the way that other people treated them when they were a teenager. The way we treat people matters. The way that you guys in middle school and in high school, listen, you don't know what a simple, hey, how are you today, could mean to somebody. You don't know what a simple conversation can mean to someone. We don't know what a simple, hey, how are you doing? It's good to see you today, can do to somebody. I know what can, it, what can happen when you don't do those things. See, our faith makes a difference not in just going to heaven one day, but it makes a difference in the world that we live in right now. It doesn't just make a difference in the big things, it makes a difference in the little things. Because the little things become big things. When we love our neighbor as ourselves, we are intentional. We, when we get up in the morning, when we do our prayer, we're not praying just for God to bless us. We're not praying for God to do so, just to do stuff for us. God, open my eyes into who I can be a blessing to. And you see, being rich doesn't just mean rich in money. You, listen, the fact that some of you have a lot of friends, have a great family that is fairly normal, you are rich. Be a conduit of that blessing to other people. Because there are a lot of people who have never... The only thing they, they've grown up in dysfunction, and dysfunction is normal because that's all they've ever known. Love them. Love them. Have a conversation. The conversation you have with them might be the only one they have all day. Find ways that you can be a blessing. Paul wrote about this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not, equality, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of men, and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, Jesus left heaven to come down here and rescue us. He left perfection to come down here and mingle with us. See, if you want to be in, involved with people, if you want, we spend too much time trying to be interesting to others. Look at me, watch this, let me tell you about myself. 
write this down. I, I heard this the other day, and I just thought, man, that, that's, that's great. Don't be interesting. Be interested. Don't try to be interesting to everybody. Be interested in them. You want to form relationships in life? Don't try to impress people. Don't try to make, look how interesting I am. Look at me. Look, look at all of this. Watch this. No. Find out about them. Two ears, one mouth. Listen to people. Ask questions. Be interested in them. Well, Chris, I, I see this person. I don't know how to help them. Talk to them. <laughs> Listen to them. It, it's interesting. When you ask open-ended questions and you're just you're listening to them, it is amazing what you will find out. And it, it is amazing how you will find opportunities to witness to other people. See, this is where our faith, this is where the rubber hits the road. We can talk about all kinds of things and I can preach all kinds of stuff, but... Isn't it interesting that James, the brother of Christ, the half-brother of Christ, talks about how our faith manifests itself through our behavior? In fact, the, it's, it, it, next week it's going to be faith and obedience. How, it, we show our faith by what we do. Here he's talking about how we interact with others. In fact, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. You know, we quote it all the time. You know, Jesus asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Second is much like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, verse 40 right there, you know what it says? On these two things, loving God with everything you have, with everything you are, and loving your neighbor as yourself, he says, the whole law and commandment stand on these two things. In other words, if you want to sum the Bible up in two sentences, Love God with everything you have and everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself. You want to sum the entire Bible up, those two sentences do it. In fact, that's what, who we are as a church. Love God, love people, make disciples. What's, makes, what's making disciples? Teaching other people to love God and love people. Right? That's what it's about. Everything hinges on those two things. He goes on in verse 8. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says you're doing well. In other words, your behavior indicates true faith. True faith is indicated by how you love others. Verse 9, contrast now. He's changing directions. He says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. In other words, notice what he says here. He doesn't say, it's okay as long as you pray to prayer. It's okay as long as you say, I'm a Christian. He says, no. He says, what you do speaks louder than what you say. What you do tells me if you're really a believer. Because, what did Jesus say? You will know them by their what? By their fruit, by their deeds, by their behavior. James is saying the same thing here. He says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Let's talk about that for a second. Prior to me coming to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I was just dependent on trying to be a good person. But you don't go to heaven by being a good person because you can never be good enough. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and died on a cross, shed blood so that I could be reconciled to the Father. When I repented of my sins, the Bible says that you, there's a U-turn that happens in your life. I, my want to changes. Instead of just wanting to please myself, wanting to make, do everything to make myself happy... I repented of living a life like that. My life turned from sin and selfishness to Jesus. My want to changed. Now I'm not living for my want to. I'm living for his want to. And as I do that, 
I'm growing in my walk with Christ so that I'm becoming more like Jesus every day. As a result, it will impact the way that I treat others. And when I do this, when that change happens, see, when I repent and trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm recognizing that that act on the cross was what reconciled me to the Lord. All right? Now I'm not being judged by my sin. Once I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm now looked at, at by the Father as righteous because of what Jesus done. His shed blood has been applied to my life. So now I'm righteous before the Lord. I'm judged by the law of liberty. Right? So he, he goes on. The next point in your bulletin. Favoritism reveals a dead faith which results in judgment without mercy. Verse 13. He says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. One day, we're all going to stand before Jesus, right? See, my life before Jesus, I was 24 years old. I was asked, Chris, when you die one day, will you go to heaven or hell? I said, well, heaven. He said, why do you say that? Well, I've tried to be a good person. Okay, translate. I feel like I have been good enough that I will go to heaven. Well, the Bible tells me that apart from Christ, you're not going to heaven. So what happens if I would have died apart from Christ? The Bible says that I die without mercy. I've rejected Jesus so the only thing I have to offer up to the Lord is the best that I have. The Bible calls that, it's like taking filthy rags and offering them up to the Lord. Without Jesus, Jesus said, For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. No exceptions, no bribes. I can't say, well, my, my dad was this, or my, my mom was this, or you don't know where I came. No. Apart from Jesus, no person goes to heaven. But when you repent of your sins and trust Jesus, the Bible tells us that we're judged by grace through grace and mercy. We're in heaven because of who Jesus is and what He has done has been applied to my life. I am now looked at as righteous before the Lord. One of the evidences is the way that we treat others. One of the fruits is the way that we treat others. In fact, Matthew chapter 6 when they ask Jesus, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? This is at the end, this is towards the end of his instruction on teaching them how to pray in verse 14. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, one of the fruits that you've truly been saved is how you interact with other people. See, I have been forgiven much, so here's the effect it should have on my life. I should be a little more forgiving towards others because I know what Jesus forgave me. I, I remember the old Chris. I remember the things that Chris did. I remember the first 24 years of my life. I remember Jesus never being even on the radar in my life. I remember me being the center of my world. And I remember that Jesus Christ died for me. Jesus Christ saved me. And for that I am eternally grateful. So when I see somebody else that does something wrong, when I see somebody living a life that they shouldn't be living, when I see somebody that has made mistakes, I don't look at them and go like this. I look at them and I see myself. When I look at young people, teenagers, that have made some poor decisions in their life, I don't go, oh, I think about where I was at that time in my life. Parents, when I look at parents who have teens that are making bad decisions and, and whose parents are at their wedding, I don't look at them and go, oh, my parents like that. Oh. No, I, I look at myself and I think I had a mom and dad that taught me right from wrong and I chose to do wrong. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but parents, it's... It's grace and mercy. What we have been shown by Jesus, we should be a conduit of that to others.
It's a fruit of our faith. It's an evidence of our faith. Now, I, I want to keep this real simple. We're going to have our invitation time. And you see, th this is another time when it talks about showing favoritism, showing partiality. In the world that we live in today, our world needs to see authenticity. I know there are going to be people moving around. Y'all, they're just coming up here and they're getting ready to do other stuff back there. Y'all stay focused, okay? Our world needs to see authentic faith. Our world needs to see that the church cares for people regardless of who they are, where they've come from, or what they look like. The world needs to see that. In a world that we live in that is trying to divide everybody by who they, how they look, what they have, what they don't have, where they live, we, ha we live in a world that is trying to divide everybody into every subcategory that you can think of. The church is the one place where all those people come together from wherever that may be. They come together as family because of Jesus Christ. Church, I, I want to tell you something. I hope you understand the gravity of the times that we are living in. I hope you see that our church, we've been placed in an incredible spot to be a shining light. God has given us that opportunity. The question is, will we be that light? Will we shine bright for the kingdom? Will the world, will our community see us as that light? Will they see you as that light? Now here, here's the thing. Right now, I, I want to ask you to do this. Is there a person that you can think of right now? Neighborhood, home, work, school, sports, wherever that may be, that is somebody that's shunned by others. Write that name down. Write that name down. Start praying for that person that God would give you an opportunity to befriend them first. Number two, if you don't know somebody, pray, God, make me aware of who you, who you have surrounded me with. See, people wonder, what well, I just don't think God's not, I don't see God working around. Open your eyes. God is working around you. God is bringing people around you for you to be a witness to them. You have a mission field. Everyone in here has a mission field. The question is, what will we do with it? Are we just going to go on living? I mean, you know, it's kind of the question I ask, where are you at in your walk with the Lord? If you're not where you need to be, what are you going to do about it? You can choose to do nothing, and some do. I'm not going to do anything about it. Really. Or you can be like some people that I have had lunch with recently that with tears coming down their face said, I don't want to stand before the Lord right now and answer for me living my life the way I'm living it right now. I want to change. Change. It's a decision. God, change my want to. And then the third thing. Now this is going to hit home. As I've been preaching this, you may say, Chris, I'm guilty right now. I've been showing partiality. I've been showing favoritism. There's some people in my life right now that I have not treated good. And I need to repent. I need to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Here's the thing. You saying that you're sorry to the Lord, for, you saying you're sorry to that person second, you don't know what opportunities that will open for you. For your faith and in your relationship with that other person. Now, every person in here should have one of those thing, three things to pray for. I want to ask you, if you would, this morning to stand. When we have our invitation, if there's any place in the church where there's no partiality, it's at the altar.
because every one of us have to come. This morning, whichever one of those prayer requests, I invite you to come to the altar this morning. Pray that God would make you aware. Pray that God would work in you and through you to be a conduit of His grace and His mercy so that people would see the love of Jesus. God, I pray that you would work in our hearts right now. God, I pray that my faith would be authentic before you. I pray that my, my faith would be authentic in the eyes of those around me. I pray that the people around me would see Jesus in and through my life. Lord, I pray for each person. Whatever business they need to do with you, I pray that they would do it this morning as we have our invitation time. I pray that they would come not worrying about what anybody would think, but because they want to see transformation in their lives and an impact through them.